sorry for the inconvenience, uh, science problems. Uh, so, okay, nice black screen, very interesting. Uh, does anybody know what's going on? I mean, it's passing here, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, cool. So the first thing I would like to tell you is about these interesting equations on the screen. So which says that the first is Faraday's law of induction, the second is Ampere's law, and so on, and so on, and so on. And by that time, some years ago, I was into electromagnetism class, and the professor came in and said good afternoon, and started showing these equations as if they were extremely natural for us. I mean, for me, it was weird. So what's this triangle and <laughs> what's the sign? So how many of you had this weird experience of uh, learning things like this without context? I mean, how many of you had a, a, at least one experience like this and it was totally frustrating? So I see many people here who had Frustrating learning experiences. I don't, I don't know if it was intentional, but my talk right after a talk about teaching kids, but I'm talking about teaching adults, which can be frustrating too. And this can cause three different reactions. I mean, you can sleep, uh, you can like feel totally lost like this panda, or you can feel like uh, I'm in the right place, or you can feel delighted. Maybe some people can understand at the first glance, but it's not everyone. So. Uh, I'll quickly talk about uh, what I do. I'm a developer. I like all of these uh, extra things in my free times. I organize meetups, I like coffees, and I like gifts. Uh, anyway, uh, this is a quick disclaimer. I know that we are from different places of the world, so for some of you, education might have been different. I know that I know some people in Norway and Finland that had tot a total different background from mine. But I, I have some friends in the United States and Europe, and they, we had a similar background when we, are, when we talk about learning, and learning especially science, math, physics, and so on. So if you don't share this, this experience, I mean, be, just be aware that I'm talking about some examples that I have uh, lived, and some of friends have, they have lived similar experience too. So why I'm talking about math and physics? Uh, I don't know for, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know about her graduation course, but I studied engineering and I had all the subjects related directly to math and physics. Did you have similar subjects, at least one or two? So some of you had similar subjects and my learning experience for them was a bit frustrating. I mean, some, yes, they were okay, I had nice professors, but they rarely contextualized me about what I was doing and or why I was learning that. And that became, you know, really sad and scary. <laughs> and anyway, uh, so every time I was in a calculus lesson, uh, usually most of the professors came, said good, good morning or good afternoon, and they showed us, you know, some crazy equations, and I always ask it, why? Why are you teaching me this? Why do I need to know this? Shouldn't, be, shouldn't I be writing code? Or why do I need to solve this equation? Or where I am going to use this? Have you ever made this question to yourself when you learn something? Even for a framework, sometimes you ask yourself, why am I learning this? Or why am I learning this into this way? And anyway, uh, I usually had bad experiences. Uh, I was almost expelled of some classes by asking this. Uh, but still, I kept these questions. I think they are very useful. Uh, so most of my professors and friends, they rarely provide me a context of you know, what was going on, why I was learning that. Uh, so this, this made, I mean, I was really frustrated by that time. And sometimes this lack of context confuses us. Think about yourselves. How many times you've tried to learn something and you got totally confused? I mean, this happens. We are human beings. And especially if you don't have a context, like sometimes someone starts a conversation and you don't have context and you get into the middle of the conversation and you understand totally wrong. This happens. This happens with math and physics too. 
so it could also demotivate us. How many times have you heard a friend saying, I hate calculus? It's, it's horrible. Sometimes I open Instagram and I search for the hashtag mathematics and most of them like, I hate math. And there is a giant list of homework and someone posting photos of the list and saying that hates math. Or same for physics. It, I mean, it's scary. Uh, the, uh, statistically, the number of uh, hate associated with math is higher than love associated with math. Why? Uh, it's such a beautiful work. Uh, and then something worse started happening. I mean, uh, this was a feedback for me. I started doing some courses, and we needed to provide feedback for each other. And then I thought was, I was becoming a machine. I started you know, putting numbers and formulas and proofs. And my colleague who gave me feedback, we were all into the same course. Um, he studied philosophy, and he gave me a feedback after analyzing my document, and he was like, please be more human, I can understand you. So I didn't provide him any context and I started putting numbers and proofs and weird structures, and he got scared. And it was when I started thinking, uh, I should be changed this way, because I am frustrated and I'm doing nothing to change this reality, so I need to do something. Uh, and then I started to think about some techniques to humanize the teaching of math and physics. I was able to put then some of them in practice uh, during my undergraduate course and after my graduation course. Uh, so the technique number one that I would like to show you, I don't know if, if everyone can make something, but that at least we can try. Uh, the, the first technique that I saw that it's, it's really useful is to tell the story behind what you are trying to teach. After all, we are all humans behind science. I mean, the, the guy who created um, a math equation for something, he's also a human being, like, he, like you, like me. So I started telling to the professors, like, hey, could you please tell the story of this equation? And some of them were like, sure. So let's start the, the class. In uh, 16th century, this guy wrote this equation. I, no, no, not, not this kind of history. I mean, life story, not, not history. And I was surprised because most of them didn't even knew. Or most of them were like, why do you want to know this? I want to know this because I want to understand how this person achieved this result. There must be some reason for this person have studied this topic. Uh, so telling the story of the, the human being, not the, 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 the word history behind it. Uh, so I figured out that it was very important. Uh, so I have some examples that I would like to share. But as we are all human beings, I mean, as uh, I started studying, the, the history of some science and the history of some topics. And I could figure out we have very interesting stories. We have family dramas behind it. We have a tragical death of really young mathematicians, for example. Uh, we have amazing random facts of, you know, someone was studying a subject in mathematics and then he discovered a very interesting subject into biology. So this is very interesting to know because this becomes a bridge between the topics. So uh, let's, let's try an example. What, what comes to your mind when I, I say the name Kepler? Kepler's laws, right? How many? Three, three Kepler's laws, oh, good, good. Uh, but personally, I was interested, like, who is this person? I mean, who is this Kepler, Kepler guy? I mean, he didn't take true laws of his pocket, like, hey, I have true laws here, let's share. But no, that's, that's awkward, I don't want to think about this. Uh, so when I think about Kepler, Kepler has a very interesting life story you should read. This person was chased by Catholic Church, I mean, during his entire life. Because, uh, I don't know if, do you know Kepler's history? I think I see a few hands here. So uh, during the time that he was doing his research about his Kepler laws, uh, the Catholic Church wanted you to believe 
that the Earth was the center of the universe, which we know it's something like weird. But by that time, they wanted to force everyone to believe this. And one important figure that started saying, hey, the sun is on the center, uh, was uh, a person called Copernicus. And Kepler was following Copernicus' ideas. And that's why he was, he, he was uh, chased during his entire life. Uh, another random fact, but very interesting. Do you like Star Wars? Star Wars is a classical science fiction movie. And probably Kepler is the first person in the literature story to write a, to write a science fiction uh, book. That's, did you know this? He wrote a book about an expedition to the moon. And I'm talking about 17th century, which is super cool. I mean, so he, we can tell that he has a strong relationship with the creation of science fiction. And nobody tells us that. Why? This is very, very interesting. So Kepler, he came from a very poor family. Uh, he had a horrible childhood. And luckily, he had a, a very rich friend, Taiho Brahe, and this guy provided him uh, instruments to make his research, but his guy passed away. And Kepler was alone again. So he, Kepler had a very lonely life, and uh, he was being chased by Catholic church the entire time, and even though he was able to make his research and prove with mathematics and physics that the orbit made by the planets were elliptic. That was incredible, because that time, people were also forced to believe only in Euclid, Euclid's book. And ellipses are not in Euclid's book, so Kepler spent a lot of time trying to prove that the orbits were a circle, and then he ended up giving up after 10 years of study, and after 10 years, he had that uh, magical moment of, aha, it's, it's not a circle. So it's something that is not in Euclid book. So anyway, Kepler has a very interesting life story. And this could be a bridge to teach uh, about Renaissance period. So, like, so we could connect better the subjects that we study. Uh, we also could chase could, could uh, teach facts about uh, Inquisition, about chases, about other important persons who suffered during this period. Uh, so we can connect these facts with a lot of stuff. And we can connect math with literature, which is beautiful. Because sometimes when I studied, I saw things very unconnected. And we can start building bridges to, to, to this. Uh, another example, Euler. What do you think when I say Euler? This question, what? Yeah, we can actually think uh, a lot of things because Euler was uh, a present person in many, 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 many areas. Uh, so Euler has a very sad story too. He got blind. He, well, he was totally blind and he was still able to do math. He, he is an example of someone who had incredible memory. Uh, he could memorize like uh, the multiplication tables for more than 600 numbers, which is weird. Uh, anyway, uh, and when we talk about um, Euler, we have a very interesting example of a person who wasn't happy ju with just one area. He made studies into biology, into medicine, into physics, into uh, geology. So it is amazing. I mean, when Euler died, the, the publishers still had material for the subsequent 50 years. After 50 years, this guy passed away. There, wa there was still new content unpublished. And the publishers were releasing things every 15 days. So you can imagine how much things he wrote about. So, and it's very interesting, and it's also motivational, because he was blind. So imagine that 
he was blind and he solved the equations about the moon orbit. And he was, he was like blind. So you can start motivating people that physical disabilities shouldn't stop you to do amazing things. Uh, this also can uh, teach us about magical issues. So if you are studying medicine or we have biology into the school, we could connect math and medicine again. And this can be also used for children as uh, an example to do not you know, uh, provide bullying because sometimes we see someone who is different. Uh, I, I had some colleagues who, who had um, phys, uh, visual disabilities and we can like show the children like, hey, we have amazing people and they were blind. So, you know, start from the beginning, uh, show bullying questions. Uh, I mean, I think Euler's story is uh, a story for a movie. Uh, but also, talking about movies, a second, move, a second technique would be producing more movies about science, but not about like, the, the, like a drama based on a figure, but a, a, a movie where you can show uh, the amazing things done by a science. So w one movie that I really think we could make is a movie about this guy, Evariste Galois. D have you heard about him? I see a few raised hands, but this guy is very amazing. I mean, his life story is amazing. Uh, he died by the age of 20, by the way. And we could make, still make a movie. Uh, he was very involved with French history. Uh, he was really good about, at math. And he was also tightly uh, involved with politics. Uh, and he was famous uh, not only for math, but for being involved in, in, uh, in uh, how do you say that, rebellions. And he went arrested several times, and he was being chased by the government, and he was there still doing math during his free time, and that's amazing. Imagine how many things you can teach related to history and also related to math. Uh, and he produced a lot of interesting things about math, but all, everything that he created unluckily was ignored. And not only unluckily, but you know, he submitted his papers to the universities and they were like, ah, oh, he's just a revolutionary, he can't do math. So again, <laughs> stereotypes. Just after, I think, 20 years after he passed away, his work started to be recognized as very original. Uh, anyway, we have very interesting things related to Galois. And if you don't know about wh what he has done for Matt, he's the creator of group theory, which is the basis for modern algebra. I mean, just that, just. <laughs> So, you know, it is so amazing and almost nobody talks about his works. Um, if you Google for group theory, you are going to see amazing applications. Uh, so, it is important to remember that behind science, there are human beings. We, we must start thinking about this. Um, this movie technique worked for Alan Turing. By the way, there is the movie Imitation Game which ran very well and, you know, there was, uh, it was selected for the Oscar. So movies can change the way our culture sees science. Uh, the final part that I would like to present is how to connect math and physics teaching to computer science subjects. So the first experiment that I've done and worked pretty well it was to teach numerical methods into um, Algorithm analysis. Uh, so they, they are very connected. Uh, and so like, what is a numerical method in mathematics? You won't solve the, the, the equation by the traditional way. You are going to do some different arrangements, discrete arrangements. And you can, it's just algorithm application. So it was a good connection. We, we joined two, uh, two subjects, which was um, the numerical methods class. 
and algorithms class, and we got a very great result. I mean, luckily we had uh, very open-minded professors who accepted to work together, and we made this run pretty well. Um, of course, don't forget to tell the story behind the numerical method analysis and the story behind the algorithm. It's very important. The second thing that ran pretty well, uh, we started teaching statistics with UI and UX. So uh, we usually have A-B tests, which is a good case to study statistics. Can you see that how these two topics are very connected? You need to analyze data when you are studying. Hey, hey, is my UX good? Do I need to change anything to the Y? So you need to analyze the statistics when you are trying to improve these metrics. And it's a good case to teach statistical instruments. So we also had an experiment where we could join uh, part of this, this uh, subject. It also ran very well. And we saw that the students were also happy to be able to apply a theoretical concept into something related to computer science. Uh, of course, uh, we, are, we are humans, we are making science, and we, sometimes we make mistakes, as many of you said in the previous talk. But it's, it is important to try. I mean, if you are unhappy with something, we need to try to change it. Uh, so the results that we saw is that the students were much more happy. I mean, I, I, I have never been a professor inside university. I made this all by being an observer and trying to help the professors to organize the content. But what I saw from my colleagues is that they were really, really satisfied with the results. And which was good for the subjects and which was pretty sad because when they, when they were attending their regular calculus classes, which had no connection with anything, he started to perform very bad. I mean, very, very bad. That was the, the, the bad experience that I had. And it shows that we should connect uh, the subjects more. I mean, if it makes people happy, we're not connecting them more. Um, so my last uh, quotes about this is like, I've seen that in software engineering, we try to connect the areas. So we are trying to bring DevOps people with software engineering people, with UI and UX people, and make them work together. Because we know that if we bring different people to different areas to make a team, we get amazing results. Why can't we make this for traditional university teaching? We should be doing this. And my personal feeling about this after some, some uh, time of you know, trying to connect the areas is that we are not fully ready yet. We should keep fighting. I mean, sometimes I feel isolated from the math department. Sometimes I feel they, they, they don't want contact with me. It's the same for physics. And we should be all working together because the limits, the boundaries of research of computer science, which is quantum computing, quantum physics, they're all connected. If you started studying quantum computing, it's, it has a lot of math, a lot. But it has a lot of algorithms. So we need to work together. Uh, to end up the, the session, uh, a friend of mine, she sent me this. And she was like, hey, Henley, I'm not using algebra today. So that was not cool. And I told her, hey, you're using your phone. And be sure that behind your phone, there is a lot of math. And this works beautiful. There is beauty behind it. Uh, so don't blame, don't spend your time blaming your colleagues or your professors or maybe your family. We won't solve anything by blaming people. We need to make our own contributions. I mean, after doing this work with some open-minded professors, I mean, I tried to do my best there. But I started writing what I knew about math history in a personal blog, media, and it's free. Uh, and then I wrote tips on how to humanize each section of the things that I had studied the history. 
So it might be useful for someone. I mean, it's a small contribution, but it's better than spend my time in blaming. Oh, that professor is boring. It's not like that. We are all humans behind it. So this, the same way uh, I make mistakes, they also make mistakes. And if they had a bad structured education, the chances of they provide you a well-structured education are lower. So we need to do our jobs. We need to tell them, hey, we are unsatisfied. Let me help you to change this. I really believe that if we are uh, working and putting our efforts to make software development community work together, why not put science as a, as a big picture to work together? I mean, I, I, I really miss attending a programming conference and see people from physics and see people from math. I mean, we should be working together. And I would like to ask you to make your small contributions, invite uh, your friends who are sometimes not direct connected with program development to attend conference because sometimes we have ideas that they don't have and they can help us to solve the problems that we have and vice versa, we can help them. We should start working uh, with, with science people in general. So thank you very much.